All right, here we are uh, in our class for First and Second Thessalonians. This is uh, lesson number 10. Uh, and if you're following along in your Bibles, uh, I want you to be at Second Thessalonians and we will be in chapter two, beginning in verse 13. Okay, so, so far in this, uh, in this epistle, Paul has uh, described the punishment awaiting non-believers and the wicked when Christ returns. And he also reassures the Thessalonians that the day, remember I said last time that when he talks about the day, he's talking about the return of Jesus. So he reassures these people that the day has not come. And there's a reason that the day has not come because there were certain things that had to take place before the day uh, uh, appeared. Uh, first of all, the apostasy had to um, occur first, and then the man of lawlessness uh, had to be revealed. We talked about that last week, right? Now, uh, in our last session, we also mentioned several ideas concerning the, um, uh, the event. First of all, that the apostasy, or you know, the falling away from the Christian faith, has already begun and uh, is already quite active in the world. And also uh, mentioned that the man of lawlessness has not yet been revealed. However, the mystery of lawlessness is at work in the world creating great evil and wickedness. So the way that you know, the, uh, the order, if you wish, the apostasy begins. We see then the principle of evil is at work in the world. Then the man of lawlessness, uh, who is promoting this principle of evil, if you wish, the man of lawlessness is revealed, and after that, Jesus returns. That's the, uh, that's the order. Now, I said we will know the end, uh, that uh, the end is the next step, um, because we know the sequence, right? And uh, it bears uh, repeating that uh, in biblical prophecy, many times we know the sequence of events, what happens first, what happens next, and so on and so forth, but we don't know the amount of time in between each, uh, in between each event. So we will know the end is, is the next step when we see this lawless power in the world manifested in a person or an entity who will be so evil, so powerful, that he will in some way claim equality with God. This face of evil, this man of lawlessness, will deceive nations to the point where the truth of Christ and the church will be seriously threatened. Now, it will be at this juncture when this lawless one will be revealed uh, to uh, Christians for who he really is, uh, it'll be at that point that Christ will return to destroy this person and bring His church with Him to the eternal glory promised uh, to it in heaven. And uh, at the same time, we'll send the wicked and the unbelievers and those who, deluded, who were deluded by the man of lawlessness uh, to their place of, of punishment. Now, in this description of these times, Paul also mentions another idea that is hard to understand. Remember, we're not saying these ideas are easy to understand, that we can pinpoint with accuracy every single uh, manifestation, so on and so forth. We know the order of things. And last week we talked about how we recognize, even in our society today, the principle of evil is at work. Okay? Now, uh, he mentions another idea that we need to kind of fit into this scenario. Um, he says um, that, um, that God will send a deluding influence on those who refuse to love the truth so that these people will be judged and condemned on account of the lie that they uh, believed. So let's read the actual passage uh, that he talks, where he talks about that. He says, for this reason God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth, but took pleasure in wickedness. So that's 2 Thessalonians verses 11 and 12. Now when we look at this here, at first glance it would seem that God forces people to believe a lie, and then He punishes them for it. And any you know, person looking at it from that perspective would say, well that doesn't seem fair. 
Is there a solution to this, uh, to this problem? There is, but you need to understand how God's will actually functions first. If we understand how God's will functions in relationship to man, we'll be able to make a little more sense of this passage of scripture. Now, the Bible explains the unusual way that God's will operates in His relationship with mankind and the material universe. So first of all, we, we need to understand there are two sides to God's will. First of all, there is God's direct will. Some things are done in concert with the operation of God's direct will. You know, God actually positively will something to happen, all right? This direct will functions in two different modes. There is God's direct positive will, and I'll give you some you know, example. God's uh, will directly uh, determines good things to happen. For example, um, God wills the creation into being. That's a good thing. That's a positive thing. God's positive direct will in operation. Or God wills that Christ come to save man, right? There's God's positive direct will uh, being fulfilled. Or God wills that His word is recorded and preserved for mankind. So God directly wills these good things to happen. And when these things happen, what we're observing, what we witness is God's direct positive will being fulfilled. All right, now the second mode is God's direct negative will. In other words, God wills directly for judgment and punishment to take place. For example, God directly wills the flood to come and destroy the earth. There's God's direct will you know, being fulfilled, but in a, a, negative, a negative way. Or God sends the plagues to punish the Pharaoh in order to force him to release the uh, Israelites. Right? God sends it. It's God's direct will being fulfilled, but it's a direct negative thing taking place. Or God uses different nations to judge and punish His people throughout the ages. God's direct negative will taking place. So uh, in many instances, God directly wills negative things to happen in order to accomplish His justice and His purposes. So God directly wills both positive and negative things to happen in the material universe and to mankind. All right, that's you know, one part of God's will. The second part of God's will is God's permissive will. A lot of events in the Bible and in history occur, but do so in cooperation with God's permissive will. And this permissive will also operates in two different modes. You have God's permissive positive will. Let me give you an example. A church was planted here in Choctaw in 1939, and years later the Choctaw Church supported a missionary in Montreal, Canada, to help build up the church in that part of French Canada. There was no inspiration here, there was no revelation, there was no miracle taking place. This was done according to God's permissive positive will. In other words, men are the ones who decided to do it and God's permissive positive will allowed it to happen. See how it works? I'll give you a more personal uh, example. Uh, my wife Lise and I, we decided to have a family. We decided that. And we wanted to have more than one child. I was an only child, I wanted a, a larger family, and so did my wife. And so we decided to have children. And we, we had one, and then we wanted more. We had two, and three, and four, and then we quit. <laughs> but in the end, you know, we're the ones who were deciding. We were the ones that wanted this thing to happen. And you know what? God's permissive, positive will allowed us this blessing. I mean, he could have stopped us, but he didn't. He allowed this good and positive thing to happen. His 
uh, his, uh, his permissive positive will was in operation. See, everything that happens in the world, everything that happens has to happen with God's permission in some way. He either causes it to happen or He allows it to happen. But nothing happens without His input, let's put it that way. All right? Um, um, so you have God's uh, 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 permissive positive will. Okay, then you have God's permissive negative will. Uh, an, an, an example, God um, uh, permits uh, some things to happen, but they're not positive things. They're painful things, they're accidents, they're whatever. Let's, let's give an example. Satan tempts Eve, or Satan attacks Job, or, or Satan manipulates the principle of evil in the world. We know that God is not the one who devises evil. He's not the one that attacked Job. But in His sovereignty, He permitted Satan to do these things. His permissive negative will. Um, there are illnesses in the world, accidents that take place, tragedies, right? Where does God's will fit into this? Well, God does not will that these things happen. He does not directly invent and send these evil things, but He permits these negative consequences of sin to affect us in different ways. See what I'm saying? And so God consciously wills certain positive or negative things to happen, and we have evidence of that in the Bible, and He also permits certain positive and negative things to happen which He does not devise, but He permits them to take place. However, regardless of what happens and under which direction of His will a certain thing falls, God knows in advance what He will directly do and He knows what He will permit others to do. And He also knows the consequences and the outworkings of all that is done and how He will use everything in order to glorify Himself and accomplish His ultimate will which is to justify the faith of the saints in Christ and to punish the wicked and the disbelievers. Okay. So nothing happens without God's will you know, being part of the equation. His direct positive or negative will, His permissive positive or negative will. So when we talk about the delusion, right? We'll go back to our passage here. When we talk about the delusion sent on the people by God, we have to take what I've just said into consideration in order to understand what Paul is saying here. The delusion is sent under God's permissive negative will. All right? So God is permitting the deceiver the man of lawlessness, to capture completely through his lies and deceptions all of those who do not love the truth. God does not invent the delusion. He doesn't lie. He doesn't approve of the deceiver, but He allows him to function for a time in the world. And those who believe the lies will be allowed to do so without any interference from God. And these will be judged and they will be judged rightly because they prefer to believe the lies rather than believe the truth. Now we know that the truth, you know, the gospel and all how the gospel is wrapped up in, in, in God's word, you know, the truth, we know the truth willed directly by God and gloriously revealed by Christ is so superior to the lie. But these people that Paul is talking about, these people preferred to believe the lie. So God permitted them to believe the lie to its fullest. You know, it's like parents, you know, the kids are doing something that is, you know, they're going to get, you know, they're playing with ink, 
markers and you need to be careful, you're going to get it all marked up. No, I want to do what I want to do, you know, so on and so forth. So the parents will say, all right, you know, I told you so, they're, they're watching, they're permitting, and they also, because of wisdom and experience, they, they know what's going to happen. You know? And an hour later the kid goes, oh, Mom, I got stuff on my hand, my new shirt. You know? So this is pretty much what Paul is saying here. The ones who love the lies and just want to you know, take in the lies, even though the truth is out there, God is saying, go ahead, take your fill. Do whatever you want. Because when you're judged, you'll be deserving of that judgment. So God, quote, sends the delusion in the sense that He permits it to happen at the hands of the deceiver. And He permits it to work fully on those who choose to believe it rather than the superior truth sent directly by God. And so in the end, this full acceptance of the lie will make judgment obvious and it'll make their judgment just and necessary and without doubt. There will be no doubt or sorrow that these people deserve what they get at judgment. Now, once Paul finishes describing the events preceding the return of Christ and the, the condemnation of those not ready for His return because of their disbelief, he then turns his attention to the Thessalonians themselves. And he says basically, since these things are and will be this way, he urges the Thessalonians not to become like the ones who love the lies and what the lies permit them to do. You see, the unwritten thing there is the people who love the lies and follow the lies do so because believing the lie permits them to act a certain way permits them to live in their immorality or to live in their dishonesty or whatever. It allows them to do what they want to do. It's one of the biggest problems you know, when you're sharing the gospel with someone and they understand it intellectually, but they refuse to respond to it because they also understand that if they respond to the gospel, if they respond to Christ, they're going to have to give up something and they know what it is that they have to give up. They're going to have to give up sin and the pleasure of sin uh, because the two, you know, the gospel and willful sinful, they, these two things, they can't, they, can't, they can't live together, certainly not in, not in peace. So since these things are and will be this way, he urges the Thessalonians not to become like the ones who love the lies, but rather follow the path taken by those who love the truth and go where that road will uh, lead them. Okay, so that brings us now to the way of truth. So after he's described God's will and, and, and you know, how the, uh, the delusion is going to take place, he talks about the way of truth. And we read in 2 Thessalonians, beginning in chapter 2, verse 13, he says, but we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. It was for this He called you through our gospel that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or mouth or by letter um, from us. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. So Paul reviews the situation and he tells them that even though there is wickedness and danger in the world, there is still reason to be thankful, especially for the church at Thessalonica. And he gives two basic reasons. Number one, he says, they have been chosen for salvation. That's one reason to be thankful. Now here, God's choosing is not in a judicial or arbitrary sense where you know, one chooses someone or something over someone else. He's not suggesting here that God said, you know, okay, you, yes, you, uh, you, uh, I'll save you and I'll save you, but I don't like you and I don't like, the way, I don't like the way your hair is combed, so not you, not you, but you. 
it's not that kind of, not that kind of choosing. You know. Paul refers to the phenomenon where God appropriates or chooses for Himself those who are being sanctified by the Holy Spirit because they trust the truth of the gospel. So let's put it another way. Paul is saying this is what God does. God is saying all of those who believe the truth and all of those who are being sanctified, you know, matured by the gospel, by God's word, you know, all of those people, I choose them. Okay? From the, at the very beginning, even before the beginning of time, God said, all the people who will choose Christ, those are the ones I choose to be with me. So Paul refers to the phenomenon where God appropriates or chooses for Himself all of those who are being sanctified by the Holy Spirit because they trust the truth of the gospel. God will choose and appropriate everyone who does this without prejudice. He will choose for Himself all who choose to believe in Jesus and has promised to do so before the beginning of time. So in this verse, Paul also says that those who are subject to God's choice of them are those who are transformed by the Spirit because of their confidence in what is true. Just like those who believe the deluding influence, all of those, God says, will be punished. And then he says, and all of those who believe the truth and are sanctified by it, I choose all of those for blessing. Now this is different from the attempt at transforming themselves using systems or methods that cannot accomplish the transformation required by God, right? So I'm, I'm kind of explaining the tail end of this idea. He says, God chooses, which ones does He choose? The ones who believe the truth. Oh, oh, those people, yes. And the ones who believe the truth and are being sanctified, are being changed, okay? Are being matured, all right? Those are the ones I choose. Well, how are they being matured? They're being matured by the Holy Spirit. They're being sanctified. They're being transformed. They're being renewed by the Holy Spirit. Unlike how people in the world try to be transformed. Some people try to be transformed by the law. We call it legalism or perfectionism, perfectionism right? I'm just going to make myself better because I'm going to obey all the rules all the time, you know, that type of transformation. And other people try to change themselves you know, by magic, the occult, by the manipulation of the spirits. Some people try to change themselves through idolatry. They worship the things that are created. They're looking for some sort of transformative power in the things of this world. Some are trying to change themselves through philosophy. In other words, man-made truth and thinking that if they articulate man-made truth clearly enough, it will be able to transform them into something else, something better. And so Paul says they can be thankful that because of their faith in the truth of the gospel, right, God's solution for sin and death, they have become the chosen ones of God and the heirs of salvation. And they are being transformed not by law or magic or idolatry or philosophy, they are being changed, they are being transformed by the Holy Spirit. And this change is real and it's personal it's eternal, it's spiritual. So let's read the second reason why he's uh, thankful. He says he's thankful because their salvation is sure. So he's thankful because they've been chosen for salvation and they're being transformed by the power of the Spirit. And then he's thankful because their salvation, this whole process here, is a sure thing. The salvation that they have will manifest itself fully when Jesus returns. And that's how he ties up this end, because you know, he's talking about 
the return of Jesus and what has to happen and so on and so forth. He's talking about what will happen to the wicked and why it will happen to them because they'd rather believe a lie than believe the truth. You know? And then he talks about God choosing them and, and so on and so forth you know, and they're being sanctified and he's thankful for them and now he ties up that end and he says what will happen to them will be completed when? When Jesus returns. You see the connection? The wicked, what will happen to the wicked and those who believe the, delu the delusion? Well, they'll be judged. When? When Jesus returns. And those who believe the gospel and are being transformed by the power of the Spirit and so on and so forth, you know, wh when will that work be completed? Well, when Jesus returns. So he ties up those two things. So the nature of this salvation is such that when Jesus returns, they will share in His glory. This is what the present transformation we call it sanctification. This is what the present transformation is working towards, what Christ will complete when He returns. This was the original intention of God's calling of them through the gospel. He called them so that one day they would be perfected in glory. And this final perfection, this completion of their spiritual transformation is an absolute sure thing. There's no doubt that it will take place, so they should be thankful for this. Thankful that they were chosen, thankful that they're being transformed by the Spirit, and thankful because that transformation will be completed when Jesus returns. It's a sure thing. It's a sure thing that the wicked will be punished, and it's a sure thing that the believers will be rewarded. So in verse 15, <clears throat> excuse me, Paul summarizes by saying, if these things are true, then don't be fooled by lies. This is how you are to respond to the lies that are trying to disturb your faith, lies that are uh, deceiving other people. Number one, he says, um, stand firm. Stand firm. Uh, uh, be mature, be strong, be unmoved, don't lose your Composure, chapter two, verse, uh, uh, chapter 2, verse 15. Let me just read the passage first and we'll go, we'll do a little explanation. So he says, So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us, right? So he says, if all these things are true, then stand firm. Be mature, be strong, be unmoved. Don't lose your bearing. Don't lose your composure, all right? And then number two, he says, hold on. Hold on to what? Hold on to traditions. This doesn't refer to human traditions like you know, we do two songs and a prayer, you know, we, have, we have worship on Sunday at 9.30 or 10.30, not those kind of traditions. He says, hang on to what you were originally taught by their teachers and their mentors, Paul and Timothy and, and Silvanus and, and these Silas, another way of saying his name. Hold on to the traditions, the, the things you were taught. So he completes the passage with a blessing, verse 16 and 17. He says, uh, in verse 16, he says, Now may our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. So he also prays that God will exercise His direct positive will. Remember what God's direct positive will is, right? What God wants to happen, His direct will, and what God makes happen. Like He made happen the, the creation and He made happen uh, Abraham uh, having a child when he was 100. You know, that God's direct positive will. So he prays that God will exercise this direct positive will in encouraging them when they are discouraged and help them in what they are to say and do. So yes, as far as the Thessalonians are concerned, yes, there are lies and condemnation for some, but Paul is thankful that they are saved and he prays that God will help them stay that way using his direct positive will. Not just let good things happen to them you know, with His direct permissive will, not just let thing, good things happen to them, but 
create good things to happen to them using his direct positive will. So this passage is unusual in that within it are listed five things that God does and then three things that we do in regards to our salvation. So God's direct positive will operates in five different ways in regards to how, uh, our salvation. He says, uh, God loves, first of all, in verse 13. The motivation for God saving us is love. He consciously, willfully, purposefully loves each soul. Number two, he says, God chooses, verse 13, once again. As we said, this means that He takes for Himself. At the beginning, God chose all of those who would believe the truth to be saved. That's how God chooses. He deliberately chose this group to experience the glory of heaven. So He loves, He chooses. Number three, He calls, verse 14. God intentionally calls everybody to glory, how? Through the gospel. That's the fairness of it. Everybody is exposed to the same gospel. Those who love the truth respond to the gospel. Number four, He saves, verse 13. 1 Timothy 2.4 says that God wants all to be saved. This is God's ultimate purpose. He provides everything we need for the complete transformation and salvation of the soul. So God loves, God chooses, God calls, God saves, and then God glorifies, verse 14. His ultimate goal is that all who respond to the call will become glorious, and some people say, well, well glorious like how? You know, like Jesus. As Jesus is, we will become perfectly like Him. Now in all of these acts, God's direct will is in operation. His direct positive will is in operation. And the significance of this for us is that if these things are God's direct positive will, then our salvation is absolutely sure. Because God always loves, right? Even when we are weak, He still loves us. And God never changes His choice. There's no surprise at the end. And God continues to call us, right, through the gospel and through the spirit within us. He continues, right, to move us to, 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 to remain faithful. And God guarantees salvation. We can trust Him. And finally, God has the power to transform us into glory. We have something to look forward to. That's why I say, boy, if anybody, sometimes you know we get, we get a little tickled in Bible class or even worship, something happens and people laugh, you know, it's just human nature. We have a right to laugh. If anybody in this whole world has a right to laugh, Christians have a right to laugh. Why? Because we have something to look forward to. No matter what our lives are like now, we have something to look forward to which is glorious. Now, on the opposite side of this relationship, we see that man also has his direct will in operation when it comes to salvation. We're not just like you know, uh, uh, puppets here. Yes, God's direct positive will is taking place, but our will is doing something too that Paul mentions here. First of all, he says, man believes. I mean, these Thessalonians chose to believe. They accepted as true the, the message of the gospel. I mean, this is, uh, there's nothing we can do to save ourselves. There's no work, there's no good deed that we can do to save ourselves. But God asks of us not what we can't do, He asks of us what we can do. And exercising our positive, direct will in believing is something that we all can do. That's why little babies, you know, why, some people say, why, why are little babies automatically saved? Because they, cannot yet exercise their positive, direct will. They cannot choose to believe because they can't you know, assimilate all the information at a, very, at, a very young, at a very young age. Secondly, man gives thanks, right? Verse 13, the giving of thanks for our blessings is part of the direct operation of our will and expression of our faith. I decide to give thanks, when I give thanks, how long I give thanks, who I give thanks to. Not to give thanks 
is usually the first sign of a loss of faith, Romans chapter one. You notice that? A weak faith is always demonstrated in a person's character by the fact that they're not thankful. They're non-appreciative. Never mind they're not thankful or appreciative of what people do. They're not thankful or appreciative of what God does. And that's usually a sign of a, a weak faith. People who have a strong faith are people full of thanks and full of gratitude. And then thirdly, he says you know, how man operates his direct positive will. Man believes, man gives thanks, and man stands firm in the truth. We do not exchange something or do something to earn our salvation. We merely hold on to what has been given to us freely by God. And we do this by retaining the faith, excuse me, by retaining the truth of the gospel as it has been given to us by Christ and avoiding the lies and deceptions that try to deny the gospel and its power. How, how do I choose to remain faithful? I choose to continue to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, what, and how do I do that? I continue to believe that God is saving me despite my imperfection. Man's direct will can reject God's love. Man's direct will can refuse his choice, ignore his call, neglect his salvation, and resist the transformation of one's soul into glory. But when man directly opposes God in this way, God's passive negative will allows man to resist God and allows man to suffer the consequences. So, God's direct will was operating from the beginning with the purpose of saving the Thessalonians and in spite of the difficult, or despite rather, the difficulties, so long as they held firm in the truth, God would ultimately complete His direct will. And what is that? Their glorious resurrection and eternal life with Christ in heaven. All right, a couple of lessons from this complicated text and then we'll, uh, we'll quit. Lesson number one, we have to want salvation. It is God's will to save us, but is it always our will to be saved? You know, do, we, do we reject His love by loving sin? Do we refuse His choice by choosing something other than Christ? Do we ignore His call by putting off our decisions? Do we resist the work of the Holy Spirit within us? You know, the question is, is our will in line with God's will? So we have to want salvation. Lesson number two, don't worry, be happy. <laughs> you know, God is in charge of our salvation from the beginning to the end, so don't worry, be happy. Our job is to trust the truth. And the truth is that Jesus is God, the cross really does save us, and we will be resurrected. Why? Because God promised and He never goes back on His word. So don't worry about your salvation. Be happy that you have it. And thirdly, comfort comes from God, not things. Comfort and strength comes from God, not from material things. The only way things can comfort us is when we do good things and say good things, not when we acquire things. So things are not bad in themselves. You know, a car is nothing. You know, food is, is not moral or immoral. That you have two TVs or three TVs in your house, you know, that's, that's neither here nor there. The point for us in all of this is that God's direct will operates for us in the same way and in the same power as it did for the Thessalonians. So let's not be overwhelmed by the power of evil in the world. Let's have confidence that God is really in charge and He really will save us. Let's be careful not to believe lies, but to remain faithful to what we have received from Jesus and from His apostles. Let's stay faithful to that. And let's ask God to directly strengthen and comfort us in the doing of good and saying of good so that we can be found busy in these type of things when Christ returns. And if we do, we will be ready for the second coming. All right, well that's our class for today. We're going to continue on. 
uh, with this uh, epistle uh, beginning in uh, chapter three next time around. God bless you. We'll see you, we'll see you then.